the topic that I'd like to uh, address today is preparing for your fourth career. I assume that some of you are already on your second or third careers, but I'm on my sixth. And so, as I look back at things that I would have wanted to have done differently when I was an undergraduate and in graduate school, I think back to the classes which I underappreciated, which I didn't like, I thought were worthless uh, in my youthful arrogance, if you will. And then I looked 20 years later and said, those things that I learned or maybe should have learned in those particular classes were actually the things which ended up being the most valuable in determining the success of my career. So let's talk about this. Preparing for your fourth career. First of all, a little bit of an introduction to Sorensen Capital. We are a private equity firm, which means that we invest in private businesses. Over the years, uh, investors have placed over a billion dollars in our care to then place subsequently in private businesses. And so uh, we take that trust very seriously. We're located in, in Lehigh in the Thanksgiving Park area which is now emerged as Utah's uh, tech center. We do leverage buyouts, which means that we buy companies that are mature, where the owners want to take a payday. And then we also invest in growth companies who are looking for capital to accelerate their growth at, a later sta at later stages of growth. So we have 22 professionals and operating partners, and so this is just a little bit about Sorensen Capital. Brad, I failed to ask, when does this, when do the lights turn off my presentation? 1220, thank you. Okay, thanks. These are, this is a representative set of the businesses in our portfolio. As you see, we have a, a nice set of, of uh, companies that are or have been in our portfolio in aerospace, high precision manufacturing, supplying uh, parts to virtually every major commercial and some military aircraft around the world. Uh, we've had a lot of investments in energy and oil field services, which gratefully we exited about a year ago. Uh, now we, they're also, also invested in the solar business. We have a deep portfolio in technology, a lot of local technology firms that you'll see on there. We were uh, investors in Omniture, um, a, a wide range of, of investments, Pluralsight, uh, Nexmo, Access Data, a broad range of technology companies. Also invest in healthcare, consumer goods, and others. But most importantly, we are a regional firm. Uh, we are headquartered here in Utah, and we uh, invest primarily in the region. If you look at our, our, our strategy, uh, we live in a very attractive um, geographic area from an economic standpoint. And this is an area where regional presence is important. And so we're located here. We founded here in 2002. And I'm gonna show some information in just a minute about just how attractive the economy is in this region as compared to the rest of the country. A lot of great companies here, and then we invest in these companies, and then we help grow and do selective transformations in their operations and marketing areas of the company or out on acquisitions, and that's how we build value. It all is dependent upon a team. That little axis down the right-hand side with a deep, experienced team is what makes it all work. And that's a little bit about our strategy. Now, where we work. Let's talk a little bit about this region. Our core geography where we look to private businesses to make an investment, um, this core area is Utah, Arizona, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Nevada, Wyoming. This is kind of nice because most investors look at this area very carefully from 37,000 feet as they look out their window as they drive by, as they fly by. But we're here, we're on the ground, we love this region, I'll show you why in a minute. Secondary states in which we look for investments are some of those contiguous states around our core area. Um, in the periphery, primarily Texas, California, Oregon, Washington, a little less in Colorado. And then if we look at the other regions of the country that we'll do some comparisons with, 
Look at the plain states, southeast, the Great Lakes, mid-Atlantic, and New England. So how does our economy compare to these other parts of the country in our core area? We're in it. We live in it. I, what I would like to do is I'd like to show you just how deeply you can appreciate where you are now when you are here. You're here at a magic time in a time of phenomenal opportunity where you are when you're here. What do I mean by that? There's our core. Uh, first of all, this is a graph that shows an index of the business friendly culture and, and, and government. Um, uh, so if we look at the orange, the hot colors, those are where they're the most business friendly. And the blue, the cold colors, are where they are the least business friendly. We have some, uh, we have some neighbors over here uh, that aren't quite as business friendly. We got some other neighbors that are very business friendly. Texas, very business friendly. You see other areas. The, the Rust Belt area, not business friendly. The New England area, not very business friendly. And uh, then some of the other areas that aren't showing up very well, kind of in between. So keep that in mind as we look at some of this other data. I'm going to switch to a browser to look at some other data. Now, this information here shows, I'm going to show you how every the economy of every state in the country has grown since we founded our business back in 2002. We'll just call it 2003 for data purposes. And along the bottom is the growth in the population. Along, along the vertical axis is the growth in the economy, the gross state product, the state equivalent of GMP, GDP. And it'll show each of these bubbles will migrate over the next 10 years. And let's just see what happens. And it's going to track Utah over time. You can see that over time, 2005, 2006, 2007, you can see that yellow line that collects Utah as it's growing in population and growing in its economy almost uniquely better than anyone else in the country. And so if you look at that, it's quite magnificent if you look at the growth and the potential and the, and the vitality of this economy. This represents Utah. Uh, there's a little dot up there. Can anyone guess who that is? Oh, man, there's an oil man in the group. Okay. <laughs> North Dakota. How did you know that was North Dakota? I work in the oil. There you go. North Dakota. What did I tell you? North Dakota off the charts in terms of the ability to do horizontal drilling and do fracking to be able to extract uh, oil and gas. And North Dakota is right in the middle of the Bakken, one of the hottest oil regions in the world. So that's a little bit of an outlier, very much uh, economy driven, uh, oil driven. But you've got here Texas, also some oil driven over that period of time. Very strong. Utah, very strong. Uh, population growth in Nevada, strong. Population growth, Arizona, strong, but their economy is not nearly like ours. You've got Oregon, uh, not as much population, but very strong growth in their, in their business. Let's just try that one more time. Just look and see how, as we track, as we track Utah over time and look at some of these other states down in this lower end over here, where there are some of these states which are stagnant, which are stale, which aren't growing, their economy's not thriving, their population's not thriving, and you have to ask yourself why. Who's this day right here? Michigan State. Boy, this is a good group. That's Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, the good traditional rust belts, not business friendly, old economy, um, up here we've got uh, some of the, you got some of the uh, uh, northeastern states, Connecticut, New Hampshire, 
New York's actually pretty good in terms of growth. The economy is so huge. Let's turn around just a little bit and look at some of this uh, represented by, of course, you have this is, a, this is the growth in gross national product. You've got great growth in North Dakota, Oregon, but Utah stands really supreme. These areas in yellow really represent this core Mountain West region in which we like to look for businesses, and you can see why. And down here you see the Rust Belt in the, in the Midwest and the Northeast, which have not been as business friendly. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is a very similar chart that shows growth in population and then growth in, this, in, the, in, 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 uh, in real gross regional product, but this is now just by region. If you cluster those regions together and see what happens, you see again, the region in which we live and in which we participate, it's taken off, it's growing, and then, oops, along there was a thing called a recession not too long ago that impacted everybody, but then a strong bounce back, and we stand out there in terms of growth. Pretty unique. Uh, the, our, in terms of this region specifically, and in terms of the peripheral region, nothing like it in the country. Southeast, pretty good. Great Lakes, Rust Belt, not good. So you live in a very special place. And you're here right at the time when this economy in this region has taken off like nowhere else in the country. Now this shows a little bit of a different look. It's got a little echo there. Uh, this is a little bit di different look, and this is shows the growth in medium-sized businesses, just the number of businesses that are, that are growing here. And then this shows the growth in small businesses on the vertical axis. So you've got small business growth, medium business growth. What's happened over the next, over the last 10 years? This is really cool. Watch closely as it goes here. Just an explosion in all directions, 2005. Then we're going to 2006, 2007. The economy goes bad, everybody goes to the left. And then all of a sudden, 2010, everybody starts to go back to the right and up. Our data ended in 2012. It would have continued in that direction. But look what we have here. What we have here is we have, I don't know if you can see this pointer well, but we have zero growth right here in small businesses, zero growth in medium businesses, and these companies right there are losing businesses in small and medium businesses, negative growth, stagnation, and then you've got this group of companies, over, this group of states over here that are growing in medium business, growing in small businesses, thriving, surviving, growing, and you, my friends, and I are right in the middle of it. Let's do some, let's some fun here. So Utah, they did their thing. Let's just go back and look and see what happened in the economy. It's just, I'm just gonna slide this across here. It's all kind of clustered together and people are starting to go. And then we get to 2007 and look what happens. All of them simultaneously with the recent unpleasantness in our financial meltdown, everything happened to move at the same time. And then all of a sudden we come along, pain, difficulty, and then all of a sudden, right about exactly the same time, look at that, right there in the middle of 2010, the beginning of 2011, everybody starts to move forward at the same time. And then you've got these winners over here. So again, let's look at some of these companies. You've got Texas over here, great, doing a great job. You got the Rust Belt over here having difficulty. Negative growth in Massachusetts. You got negative growth in the in the in the in the uh, in the uh, back up up in the uh, east northeast. Rust Belt. Who who's this person? Who's this who's this character here? That's pretty large. That's growing. That's where the businesses are fleeing like crazy, as if they were in the Rust Belt. Who is that? Economically, California looks like the Rust Belt. Don't tell them I said that, if anybody's ever come. <laughs> obviously, the, obviously, Silicon Valley is thriving like crazy, but there are so many parts of the state that are not. Now, 
Let's take another look at this. Again, as we show those that have grown, that are net positive, again, these core region that we're in, and then look two thirds of the state by 2012, we're still net negative. Let's just watch and see what happened here as we go through time, as we roll back the clock to our founding point, it's just an arbitrary time really. And let's take that forward and look and see how pretty much all of these businesses are rising. Everything's kind of going up. You got some real losers over here with respect to in terms of economic growth and businesses fleeing from those states and going for areas where there are more favorable business environment, more favorable cost, more favorable structures, um, maybe a better climate. I don't know what all the factors are, but then you see what happens when the economy starts to go bad in 2007, 2008, boom. Everybody just takes a huge dive and businesses are folding and, 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 and small, medium, or small businesses are just dying. And then all of a sudden, and you've only got a few, you only have a few states over here who are really thriving in that environment, still net positive. Of course, we're in the middle of it. And then as the economy starts to recover, some states start to get a little bit more growth. But by 2012, you can see that there's still the majority of the country who have, have net losses in small businesses. Okay, the, the, the usual suspects. Does this make sense? Can you see how, what a wonderful opportunity you have here, where you are, when you are here? This is an amazing time to be here. And so I would encourage all of you to think about the opportunities in such a way that, uh, and, and just see how, how fortunate you are. Now, let's, let's take a little a walk through time on, on my personal career. I'm gonna use my personal career as a bit of a case study for what you might anticipate in your future. Um, I, this is my sixth, I'm on my fifth career, and, and who knows what my sixth will be. And every one of you, well, not everyone, most of you will go through three or four or five career changes by the time you get to be my age. And so I know that you're here to prepare to be able to support yourself and to be able to gain the skills and knowledge and capabilities to get maybe that first career. But while you're getting that first career, I want you to start to think about what you're doing here and how that can help you on your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth careers. Uh, it's, it's, it's in preparatory for my career path, uh, I'm a farm boy. I was raised on a cattle ranch. Went to work full time at age eight. Worked till till 19, 19 through 21, pretty traditional in my family, served an LDS mission. Then I got a college degree in a very exciting subject of statistics. I know y'all love me for that. A minor in economics, and, I was, and then I was a computer programmer uh, as going through college for a couple of years to help fund my college education and a research assistant. Got some publications out of it. Then I went, I got an MBA. At that time, it wasn't, um, it wasn't uncommon to go directly from undergraduate to graduate school, which I did. And I went to, got an MBA, then it started the, if you will, the more formal part of my career. Strategic planning at the corporate level, large industrial corporation, became a CEO, then a private equity precursor to Sorensen Capital, fundless sponsor, private equity as a fund manager, and then also private equity in a performance group. Fifth, I'm on my fifth career and I'm 60 years old and I still have some gas in the tank and so who knows where my next careers will be. But let's talk about this. Preparation, cattle ranch. Anybody raised on a farm on a ranch here? Yeah, there are a few of us. Good going, I appreciate that. Well, I was, that was me, that's not my picture, but our place looked a little bit like that. <laughs> I like that. Um, what did I learn that was useful for me? I learned responsibility at the age of 9, 10, 12. We were given things to do and you know, you do it and you take accountability for it. And uh, it was a very extremely, it was an extremely important part of that. Uh, you learn resourcefulness because you did, you fixed what you had. You would only go and get somebody else to fix something 
if it was really, really broken and beyond repair. But you learn to be resourceful and, and do things on your own. And uh, probably more importantly than more important than anything, learned hard work. Uh, we worked about 70 hour weeks. I started full time when I was eight years old to go out and help with the ranch hands and drive the tractors. And yes, I was driving at eight years old. And uh, all my brothers would buck the bales. Uh, but we learned how to work hard. We learned how to work really hard. Next, uh, preparing for uh, uh, preparing for a career, I, I went on a, a mission. It's not, I didn't go on a mission to prepare for a career. Obviously, I did that for other reasons. But again, continue on some, uh, some benefits or some results of that. Uh, we worked 80 hour weeks. We, st we stepped up and, uh, and, and the farm work was easy compared to this. We worked 80 hour weeks and learned dedication to an organization and total immersion in a cause. Um, and that was, a, on the one hand, a sacred experience for me, and, uh, but on the, on the other hand, it was a very much a learning experience to be able to say, what does it mean to be totally dedicated to a cause or to an organization? Very valuable. I was in Peru. Any Peruvians here? All right, nobody. Um, and then a further preparation, I went to undergrad. How many of you here are undergraduates? How many are graduate? Okay, so predominantly undergraduate. So what did I learn as an undergraduate? <clears throat> Most importantly, I learned how to learn. Um, took a lot of classes I thought were meaningless, youthful arrogance, um, but I learned hard work because I was competitive and I wanted to do well. Those grades mattered to me. And I know grades aren't everything, but for me somehow they mattered. I wanted to do better than the next person, and I wanted to graduate with honors, and I wanted to do these things, and it was important to me. And I learned competitiveness, and I learned how to manifest that in a setting with other people. And then I would say that we went on to get a foundational subject matter. I learned math, I learned statistics, I learned economics, I learned accounting, I learned computer programming, and got a, a, a part-time job. I'd taken one computer programming class, and just for your information, it wasn't C++. Or, um, Fortran, and I went in to apply for a job with one of my professors. And he said, um, well, here's what we need to do in this very complicated analysis that had to be done and, and proven out in data gathering sequences and analytics that were really pretty sophisticated for the time. And I had, had one class. And I, I said, well, you know, you really need a, a pretty good computer programmer here. And in full disclosure, I've only taken one class. And he looked at me, got angry, and said, young man, where do you think you are? I'm here, you know, <laughs> standing here in your office. He said, you're in a university. Do you want to learn or not? So I want to learn. He says, well, get to work. And so we got to work. We learned how to do it. We solved some really complicated problems together, got some publications out of the really cool analysis that was done. And I learned a lot. But I would say I probably didn't learn anything greater than in that office that day when he challenged my weak thinking saying that, well, uh, should I, I, I'm not quite prepared for this. Well, of course I wasn't prepared for that. But he was willing to let me learn, and I'll ever be grateful for that. But then I also got some foundational, instead of, in, in addition to foundational subject matter, we developed some foundational abilities. Abilities to be challenged, abilities to be tested, abilities to perform. Learned analytics, generally speaking, that was pretty inherent to the field of statistics and pretty inherent to the math and the economics, but also learned logic, how to have good sound logical thinking through the analytical process. Uh, really learned critical thinking skills as we had to solve problems and uh, problem solving. And, and actually some of the most important learning I had was in my, was in my non-core subject matter in the humanities. 
I was a science person in math and happened to marry an artist. And so we've learned from each other to have a left and a right brain together make a better brain. And so uh, some of the greatest lessons I learned were in those areas where I wasn't quite as interested. As I look back, they were the most valuable because they expanded my horizon and got me thinking outside of the box in certain areas. And those are areas are where I learned some more of my more interesting abilities that, uh, that it later on proved to be very valuable. So I would encourage you to really relish all of the curriculum that you've been given. It may not, you may not see it as important for your first job, but you very well, well may find it very important for your third or fourth career. Then I went on to graduate school. Again, foundational learning. Again, learned how to learn, learned really hard work. I mean, that graduate school was rough. I mean, it was, it was intimidating, it was challenging, um, and, and it was hard. And l learned uber competitiveness because there, was, there were, was a group of people there where we were all vying for maybe to get some honors and we were really competitive. All of us were good friends. We worked together, but we were really competitive um, on the basketball court, on the golf course, and in the classroom. We all had a good time together. But there we learned some very job-specific subject matter. We learned finance, we learned strategy, learned marketing, learned accounting, learning operations. Those things which would immediately allow me to go in and add value to an organization and to an entity very important foundational specific learning. But then the advanced learning, really, uh, the relationships were probably as important or more important, well, actually they're probably more important by orders of magnitude in my third, fourth, and fifth careers. Those relationships where we established on the court, on the course, uh, studying together, uh, learning together, uh, rivaling together, uh, those relationships have lasted a lifetime and have proven to be uh, very valuable. Uh, one of my business partners today, one of the co-founders of Sorensen Capital, was in my study group. And we had a great time together. We, his career went this way, my career went this way. We got together to form Sorensen Capital many years later. Those relationships are vital. So please take the time to I'd also advance competition. Um, you know, grades are, are an artificial way to measure your real learning, and they're a, an imperfect way to measure your real core takeaway from a class, but they're a great way to measure your competitiveness. <laughs> Because the smartest person doesn't always get the best grade. It's the person who cares the most and has the most drive and the most ambition get the best grade. And I will probably, with a high degree of certainty, say that those same attitudes are those things which will carry over into the workforce. That competitive drive and that competitive attitude will carry over. And those same people are going to be the ones that end up being competitive in the marketplace. It's not always true. The 4.0 student doesn't always rise to the top in all areas, but that 4.0 student often is a little bit more valuable in certain areas and others in other areas. But that competitiveness, particularly if your natural ability doesn't immediately take you to the top, that competitiveness is something that's really important. So advanced competition and then the expanded horizon. As we get into graduate school, we started to interact with people from all over the world and who had experiences in many different areas. Again, relationships were very important. So these were very important foundational things. And then I started my career. I moved to the Rust Belt, Indiana, and I went to work for an industrial corporation. It was a conglomerate of industrial companies. And I would, uh, got hired on as an associate. And I was an associate in the strategic planning group of this large corporation. Uh, and there are, guess what, 70 hour weeks, you know, pay, paying your dues. Um, not all the time, 
but on many times these were 70 hour weeks as we were evaluating and doing very important projects. But there uh, became a manager and then a director and then a vice president and at the time we were a Fortune 500 company. So at a very young age, those same skills, abilities, attitudes, mentalities allowed me to do pretty well and rise to become an officer of a Fortune 500 company at a very young age. One of the things we did is we were the, uh, we were the leader in hospital room equipment, patient beds. It's a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. And in all of the associated uh, furniture and so we learned strategy, okay? And we took that company from sort of a single cluster of products to uh, birthing beds. This is a transformer bed that you lay in the patient for labor, for delivery, and then for postpartum, same bed. And it used to be that you would go into four or five different rooms through that process, and that's not a good thing. And so we were able to really literally transform the labor delivery and recovery process in hospitals. Then we made a major, act. that was an acquisition. We acquired a company that is an air fluidized therapy bed that allowed uh, patients with decubitus ulcers and flap surgeries and burn patients to heal by floating literally in a bed of sand with a little sheet between them. Allowed the pressure to be relieved and it was a big acquisition integration. Then we took that from another, one, an, another step into prevention of those uh, bed sores and, and help transform this corporation from a kind of a single family to a multiple family, allowed it to spin off and become now its own public corporation. So it was a great, a great experience in the area of strategic planning, uh, consulting, internal consulting. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we learned what, what, what were the takeaways there? Uh, business strategy, learned that in school. Learned it from experience. Uh, business consulting, um, from experience. Acquisitions and valuation of companies, experience there, integration of, of an acquired company into the, the main business. Learned that there. Financing, learned a lot about financing in school, but there was a lot more to learn through experience. Value creation, that was, con that was continued learning. Board level governance, how do you, what does it mean to sit on a board of directors and how is that different from running a company? Very different, good experience. And then core business principles had, had a couple of mentors which were very, very valuable in that first career. So there's a lot of takeaways uh, that learning by experience and by mentors was really, really important. Now, career number two, we bought a company. I became a CEO of a worldwide corporation this was an acquisition. This was the market leader for ultra secure uh, applications where if you really need to have something locked down with tremendous security, then you used our products. They were on the White House, Pentagon, missile silos, embassies, apartments in New York City, the places where you really need serious security. New York City was not a safe place at the time. And it, it was involved very, very high precision manufacturing, very complicated parts, lots of little micro parts with lots of operations and spinning and keys that had angle cuts on them, and a lot of product innovation and worldwide distribution and extensive patents. I want to take you through just a little bit of a case study by saying I became CEO of this business and what did I have to do? What were the challenges that we had? This is a picture of our factory. Our factory at the time was uh, you can't see this terribly well, but the factory would have very much departments. This happens to be the lathe department. You had the machining department. You had a sub-assembly department, an assembly department over there. And it was very much a challenge. And I, when I got a, essentially a plane ticket and started to travel across the country and meet all of our customers. So what can we do to help you improve your business and help our business? What product? And I just got, I just got hammered with your factory's terrible. Great quality product, nothing like it in the market, but your service out of your factory is ridiculous. Oh boy, now I've got a big problem. So what happened? I went, got some analytics in place and started to study what's going on. And this represents, if you will, the path of one of our products. If you look, this is the path 
of that little internal component right there through this factory. And went through all these different departments. And, and week number, from the time the customer wanted it, it was around week three when it finally got entered as an order into the factory. How are you feeling about this company right now? And then it went through all of these different departments, along here, quality krill, stockroom, brass line, all these different departments and, and, and unconnected operations to finally get out to shipping around about week number 12. Okay, that ain't no way to run a railroad. So we had a big problem. So what we did is we engaged in a process multiple years of transforming this into what we call just in time. Today we call it lean. We created a vision for what this factory needed to look like in terms of the little micro sales. And so instead of going through this factory, you'd get an order, you'd take some components from here, you'd do a little machining there, send it to plating, have it some assembled and gone. And the vision was to be able to deliver a product in a day. Now, imagine yourself standing before your employees here. You're new to the business. You come back and you say, we've been delivering in 12 weeks. And our vision is to be able to do it in a day. I wish I could go back and do it differently the next time because there was a lot better ways to have approached it, but we dug in. Well, I mean, we went after it. So um, what happened is we then took all those departments and got new machining and all that place. Oh, by the way, this process took 12 weeks and that product 12 traveled two miles through the factory. And therefore, now the product goes through this little cell right here, goes over to plating and back, and done with a couple of people running instead of about 10. All of these, these boxes right here are stacks of empty, nested inventory bins that used to be filled with work in process inventory. That's 120 yards long. <laughs> I paced it off. At the time, we didn't have good equipment in golf. That was a perfect nine iron for me today. It's a pitching wedge, just so you know. <laughs> but at the time, that was a nine iron. There was 120 yards of empty inventory bins that we were able to take out of that factory by going to lean. This was what one area of the factory looked like before. After we grew the business two and a half times, that's what it looked like afterwards. A couple of basketball courts of free space. So what happened is that this time went from all of this down to, all of this got translated down to this, as far as the total production time and delivered from quick ship in a day. Now, the question is, that required a lot of team transition, transformation. Uh, a few of these people, this person, this person and this person were new to that group and this person, everybody else was there from the very beginning. So it did require tremendous transformation and training and learning and it did require a lot. But what it allowed us to do is that, be, that beforehand our layout was functional. We went to customer teams in the customer service area. Time two to three weeks, went to 10 minutes to a day. Factory before and after. Nine departments, all independent from one another. Then we went to seven cells with all, all operations in each cell. Went from eight weeks down to the same day or, or a little bit longer. So that also then allowed us to have increased flexibility. Any one of 20,000 part numbers for any quantity we could process as if it were a large batch. It was just as easy. Strategy, we create our own distrib distributor uh, center, quick ship, and we went direct to dealers and bypass distributions, we limited 250 distributors and took on that function ourselves. We love UPS. Um, so, but what that allows us to do, it allows us to get a direct relationship with our, our customers, allowed us to have a huge margin improvement by absorbing that margin that was typically uh, previously done by distributors. Um, we reduced $8 million of work in process inventory and used four million of that to buy new, smaller, more nimble equipment. Our productivity basically doubled. We reduced our space 25% by growing two and a half times. We grew, started to grow twice as fast 
and it increased the value two and a half times. So knowledge, you know, bearish to it. This is now old news, but at the time, you know, this was not apparent how to make all this happen. But some of the issues, the technical ability to do so was known. Um, you could get people to come in and teach you how to reduce setup times and do, but it was the culture that was the real challenge. And when you get out in business and you're leading a company or a department or a team of three, are the cultural er elements are, are, are much more uh, difficult to deal with, the commitment, the involvement, the processes, the leadership, the mentality. And these are the things that you'll need to learn here and elsewhere. So the other thing we did is we came up with a new generation of product, mechanical locks are kind of were going out. We could see that, and we went to then electronic access control in each of those cylinders there and beyond. And so what we ended up with is um, career takeaway, takeaways from career number two. Um, <clears throat> business transformation, operations, channels, product development. Um, had many, many mentors, many consultants, many advisors, many new hires we brought on board. Couldn't have done it on my own. It, there's just no way. Uh, and then leadership, uh, I learned that from the University of NH, or HN, University of Hard Knocks. Made a lot of mistakes. A lot of books, seminars, mentors, and also learned the power of vision. to be able to create a vision and lead a company toward it. So all of this, then the careers three, four, and five um, requires two sets of skills. One, investing, which is the art of the deal. Be able to find a business, persuade them to uh, sell to you, to be able to evaluate it, finance it, do the acquisitions. There's a whole set of investing skills. But managing a portfolio, transformation of the business, board level management, acquisitions, integrations, the culture, the hard work, the persistence, all of those things that I learned since I was eight years old carried over that I utilize every day. Everything that I learned in school, everything that I learned on a tractor, everything that I learned in any business, we utilize every day. So let me ask you a couple of questions. How and where do you learn how to build or transform a business in an unfamiliar space with problems not previously known to you? not taught to you in your school, and not in your experience base. What do you do? Do you say to your, you say, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not qualified to do that. You might want to get somebody else. Luckily, I had a pretty stern professor who said, get to work. What is the job of your university here? What are they here to teach you? What are you here to learn? What will you gain for your, from your university experience that will help you in your first, second, third, fourth, and fifth careers? Let me suggest planning for your fourth career. Your first career, you, want, you need subject matter expertise. You need to go out, if you're going to go out in accounting, you need to know accounting. If you're going to go out in sales, you need to learn sales. If you're going to go out, you need a first career. Uh, you need job-specific skills. You need proven performance. And that proven performance might just be in the classroom because we as employers say, if you worked hard and you did well in the classroom, you're going to do well. On, more, more likely than not, you're going to do well elsewhere. But you need drive and hard work. You need to be able to gain out of your educational experience that drive, that hard work, that enthusiasm, that thirst for learning. In your fourth career, it's going to be based on performance of your previous careers. But it's extremely important that you have continued learning, continued problem solving, continued curiosity, continued creativity to be able to learn how to solve problems uniquely and with a great attitude and with enthusiasm and with drive and with leadership and with vision and with ambition. Those are the things that make your third and fourth, third and, fourth and fifth careers and drive and hard work. That's, that's unique to everything that you do in school or in life or in anything else. You've got to have fun along the way. Don't get me wrong. We have fun along the way. And so preparation at your university, 
You're learning, you're gonna learn here how to learn, you're gonna learn hard work, you're gonna learn competitives, and you're gonna have foundational subject matter that will get your first career off to a start. And that's why many of you here, maybe perhaps even most of you are thinking that way right now. But I would like to maybe encourage you to think about those foundational abilities. Those foundational abilities that you can acquire along the way, as long as you're taking the journey, why not pick up these as well? The analytics, the logic, the thinking skills, the creativity, the problem solving, the thirst for learning. That thirst and, that thirst and learning how to learn will do more for your subsequent careers than anything that you learn here. And if you can learn those things, if you can learn these things, you're done. You know, you're, you're ready to go. You're ready to go. And so those are the things that matter in your second through your sixth careers. So I would hope that you would consider this and that you would have that drive and ambition and the thirst for knowledge and the thirst for learning and the curiosity for what's going on in the world and absorb uh, the opportunity that you have here. So whatever, you, whatever your preparation, here, there, you know, go to undergraduate school, whatever you do, learn responsibility, resourcefulness, vision, hard work, creativity, drive and competitiveness, those same things that we learned back on the farm, if you will. And so, let me summarize. <clears throat> the opportunities that you have here opportunities that you have in this geography, in this university, uh, in this region are boundless, are, are, only, are only limited by your drive, your ambition, your hard work. Um, please capitalize on that and think about that. But also I would just encourage you that while you're here at this university, absorb everything that you possibly can. Um, learn from people around you. Um, appreciate various degree, various aspects of knowledge outside of your targeted education, and it will serve you well. So, with that, any it's time for questions or no? Or? I think we're there. Actually. Okay, we're there. Okay, we're done. <laughs>